Hello, my name is Carlos Tabata, and I'm here to talk about cognitive systems. If you know me already, you might know that I do research on mathematical physics and differential geometry. However, this talk has nothing to do with that. This is a little passion project of mine that aligns with recent developments in SEMP, the Spanish association that I chair at the moment. So I hope you enjoy this talk. All right then, let's begin with the talk. A landscape of cognitiveness. So this is the title I've chosen, and you note that indeed there is a word, there's strictly not in the dictionary perhaps, but I wanted to use it to convey an idea that I hope will be clear by the end of the talk. Now, before we start, let me give a motivation and a little disclaimer. So first of all, why did I get thinking into these, into these topics? So my first motivation was to identify cognitive systems, in itself a concept cognitive system, quite hard to define in itself, that are something else than, than human brains or human nervous systems. So this was my initial idea and, and the thing that kept me thinking for, for actually many years. And then, uh, well, I started doing a little bit of reading and I put this little talk together as a, as a motivation, mostly a self-motivation to further read into these topics, but also because I started seeing an, a unifying theme under the, the relatively modern field of cognitive sciences. And I think it's a, it's a field that is not sufficiently visible as a, as a branch of science in itself, because indeed it, it agglomerates many different sciences. And this talk is a little bit of a love letter to the field of cognitive sciences. Now, the disclaimer, of course, is that I am not a cognitive scientist. I don't have any formal training on this, on this subject. And this talk is mostly um, intended to evoke, entice, and illustrate. And so it's, it should be taken as such. Um, this obviously does not replace any, any further and, and, and proper training and, and proper reading on, on all these topics. So there will be links in the description and uh, all, the, all the green text on the slides are clickable. If you do download, download a PDF that is attached to this talk. Um, so I do invite you to, to explore the literature and, and, and do all the reading and, and all the training that, that is um, motivated by this talk. But indeed, this talk is just a big uh, motivation and, and a, a sort of a grand statement of the importance of these topics and why I think they are exciting. Okay, so let's begin. So we always begin with human cognition as the center of, of, our, of our discussion. Indeed, because we are human and we are, have human minds and we are thinking in terms of human minds. So um, I just wanted to begin by listing some of the distinctive features uh, that, that human minds uh, appear to have. Right. So, so briefly, we clearly have uh, goal oriented decision making. This is our daily life. And indeed, we observe that in other anim animals, but it, it's indeed part of, of human cognition. We have symbolic communication. I am talking through words. You see the words on the screen. There's symbols everywhere. So we indeed have a very deep uh, system of symbolic communication in place. Um, computing and logic, of course, you're probably watching this on some form of device that runs on binary logic. And we have mathematics. We have science that, that is uh, strongly founded on all this uh, higher cognitive uh, concepts that have been built uh, culturally and and constructively for, for millennia. Indeed, something that is not observed in, in any other species and is quite characteristic of humans. Now, we have a very, very strong theory of mind. Uh, if, if anyone remembers a bit of anthropology and human history, you might remember that Homo sapiens was particularly uh, successful in, 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 in its social infrastructure. And, um, and, and that seems to be what made Homo sapiens so dominant uh, in, in evolutionary terms. Of course, uh, creativity in in, uh, so in solutions in, in in finding solutions. It's also a very human trait that that we seem to be able to think outside of the box, so to speak. And to think us outside of the box, there needs to be an outside, and that's what we call cosmology. So human beings have a very good sense of cosmology, and this is a grand word to simply uh, denote the notion of a hold, right? I mean, we we do have a unified experience. We seem that. Something as distinct as having a glass of water in a, in a warm day and uh, doing maths in the afternoon or, or watching a movie in the evening, that all is part of the same life, of the same whole. That is uh, having a good sense of cosmology and it seems to be uh, quite uniquely human, as we will see later on. And then finally, when many different human minds are put in place, uh, some, some characteristic dynamics emerge and... Uh, ethical behavior, moral considerations appear, and then of course there are all these um, political structures that also prop up, that we are all very familiar with. Okay, so now that we have the human cognition uh, a little bit uh, uh, identified and uh, sort of brought to, to, to awareness, uh, let's try and, and, and go to the opposite end of the spectrum. Let's go to the, to the other end of the, of the sort of conceptual scale and try and, and, and abstract as much as possible what cognition could be or, or what a cognitive thing is doing 
in the real world. And this is, uh, I want to illustrate this concept with, with the notion of the cognitive loop. Now, this is something I, I just uh, summarized myself, and I, I do invite any, any expert watching this video to, to refer me to the proper literature and the proper, proper terminology. But I think it, it, it is a good summary of uh, phenomenologically what a cognitive system would probably end up being in, in general terms. So a system is something that, we, that, that is part of a world and something that uh, incidentally we can measure eventually. We are ourselves part of this world or some, some kind of world. Now, I'm not, I'm not specifying this is the real world or physical world or anything like that. It could be something, for example, programmed in a, in a computer or whatever. But it's indeed some, some world where there are parts and, and their parts or, or the parts of the world relate to each other um, in, in specific ways. And so that's how we're going to characterize systems within this world. So a cognitive system will be characterized in so much it relates to, to other parts of the world. So we're going to take another part of the world and we're going to call that an object. It could be another potential cognitive system or it could be anything. And we're going to characterize the cognitive interaction between this, our, uh, our cognitive system or you know, uh, the, the tentative cognitive system that we're trying to, to study. And, and we're going to see how it connects to, to other elements of the world. So the first line of interaction is uh, what we call an input or perception, perhaps. And this is an interaction between the object and the cognitive system. And, you know, it happens smoothly. It, it, it preserves the, the structure and integrity of the cognitive system. It's something that is somehow fine and, and it has a sort of a, usually a sort of a low energy transfer. This, this kind of properties that, you know, the, the, the scale of the, of the cognitive system, the energy scales of the cognitive systems are much larger than the energy scales of the, of the interaction that we, um, that we uh, conceptualize as input or as perception okay so in particular the structural integrity integrity of the cognitive system is, is is preserved throughout this input or perception uh, process and then what happens is that the cognitive system rearranges itself in a in a process that we we, we call processing uh, appropriately and and then uh, in, in in a fairly independent way uh, or, or fairly unrelated to the object at least directly and and then it produces uh, a form of outcome in, in behavior, and the cognitive system has a way to interact back with the object so that there is an action, so the object is transformed in some way. You can, you can think of the, the most elementary example, so uh, maybe a, a little child playing with a, with a cube and, and input is vision and then out action. The processing is the brain of the child processing the object, and then the action is you know, extending the arm and playing with a cube and, and moving it. Now, the reason why I think this is so relevant and so illustrative is that this is a recursive activity. This does not just happen once, but this can be looped and it can be uh, replicated over and over again so that there is this constant feedback that can lead to the notion of learning and the notion of experimentation and, 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 and so on. And, and so I think this, this particular um, uh, scheme that is on the screen at the moment will, uh, will be a template that, that fits well into the many examples that we're going to review. So the plan for the talk is see a few examples of potential cognitive systems that we will, we'll, we'll see they all fit this cognitive loop and they are quite fundamentally different in terms of their origins and structure, perhaps. And then in the end, we'll see really how structurally different they are and, and then um, comment on some of, the, some of the conclusions that we can uh, derive from this and in particular uh, argue for the concept of cognitiveness. Uh, it's, it's a made up word that we need to justify by the end of this talk. Okay, so let's get into the first category of, of examples of, of, of um, cognitive systems, which are non-human nervous systems. So we're going we're to look at two big classes of non-human animals. So the first are apes, because they are nervous systems that are very close anatomically and genetically to, to our system. So we can think of them as a, as a bit of a, you know, infinitesimal uh, uh, deformation of, of our own uh, cognition in some sense. And then we're going to look at ce cephalopods, which are essentially the, the most distant cognitive animal that, that we find uh, in the world right now. So um, we're going we're gonna to just uh, give a, a few hints and a, and a few references on, on this just to uh, paint the picture of, of uh, cognition in the animal kingdom. Okay, so let's review briefly uh, ape cognition and social dynamics. So what do we see in, in, in chimps mostly? Well, great apes, orangutans, gorillas, etc. So the first thing we see is um, communication. So communication does happen, symbolic communication that is, does happen naturally in, in, in chimps, in, in great apes, and non-human great apes. Indeed, um, 
to a sophistication that is much, much uh, lower than in humans. And in fact, um, the famous examples of chimpanzees using sign language uh, um, has been somehow uh, debated for many decades because it, it, it's not clear whether there is an actual understanding of the language that they are using. It's, it, it's more of a collection of signs and it's an impressive collection of times it's hundreds of different signs and, 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 and ways of, of combining them. But there's, that doesn't seem to be a, an actual deep understanding of the functioning of that, of that language. So it falls under, uh, perhaps falls under the, the imitation and pantomime sort of uh, behavior that is, that is indeed um, common in, in, in many other species. Now, the other uh, aspect of, of uh, chimpanzee cognition that is very striking for a human that, that, that witnesses it is a theory of mind. Chimpanzees and, and great apes in general have a very good theory of mind, and um, there are many um, there are many um, studies that show how chimps know uh, whether a chimp knows, and this is something that is highly non-trivial, uh, and that's what you know. In uh, etologists uh, call a theory of mind. This uh, sounds as a, as a grand concept, but it's essentially having a notion, a cognitive notion of the mind of others, right? So, so that is something that has been uh, checked uh, time and again in, in in research, and and it's something that's probably quite similar to us in in that respect. Now. What is also very similar to, to human societies is, is uh, the, the presence of morality and politics. Indeed, phenomenon like altruism, phenomenon like um, uh, tyranny and, and uh, you know, democratic rights and, and, you know, in a very primitive way are, are observed in, in, in natural clans, in, in, in wild clans of, of chimpanzees. And I do invite you to explore all this, all these links, which are down in the description and in the, in the attached PDF. So all the, all the green texts are uh, links to to the literature where you can delve, and they're actually very easy reads. They are, they are, some of them are quite technical, but but they they they, they get they get to the point fairly straightforwardly. So I invite you to read on all these topics. Now, moving on from from um, from apes uh, and and our closest relatives in the animal kingdom to the most alien relatives that we could have, I would say in the in the animal kingdom, and this is uh, cephalopods. So so cephalopods are an absolutely amazing. Um, kind of animals uh, because they are a, a, a good example of the, you know, the, the saying mind over body. And so how can we summarize the interest, the evolutionary interest of, of cephalopods is, is indeed uh, the fact that you can have some, uh, um, some ammonite in the, in the, in the Cambrian period, hundreds of millions of years ago, um, with a very hardened shell, very de defensive um, evolutionary strategy, clearly um, it's not the fastest moving animal, so it will be vulnerable to predation. And so that, that hard shell will be indeed a very, very good asset to have. Now, fast forward to the present, and we find this absolutely adorable uh, uh, animals, the, the cattlefish. So how did this happen? How did these animals essentially lose the shell when apparently there's nothing to be gained. It's essentially the same animal just without the shell. So what was selected here was intelligence. And these this, this, this animals are highly intelligent, especially for being um, invertebrates. Again, invertebrate or vertebrate is not just, you know, a, a terminological classification. It, it is anatomically a big difference in terms of how the, how the system is organized. And so um, the fact that these animals are highly intelligent and highly cognitive, at least as far as we, we can tell for now, uh, there's a lot of research to be done, but so far we can tell they're highly cognitive, is, is quite striking. And so the, the evolution of intelligence in cephalopods is, is many times used as a, as a benchmark for um, how, for example, human intelligence was also selected by, uh, by environmental presses and, 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 and relations and uh, social relations between the different individuals. So indeed a very, very fascinating topic. So. Um, very different animals uh, from uh, from vertebrates even not just uh, um, apes but vertebrates and uh, i also recommend reading uh, other minds a, a book about um, some uh, colonies of octopus that that that, uh, that show uh, behaviors that are indeed well beyond many behaviors uh, of many vertebrates even not just for invertebrates so indeed a very interesting class of um, biological potential cognitive systems Okay, on to the next category, artificial neural networks. This is a hot topic right now. I'm sure many, many of you watching are very aware of the recent advancements of artificial intelligence and how prevalent it already is in, in, our, in our technological environment. 
So I want to stress, to stress two recent developments, um, both uh, spearheaded by, by DeepMind, uh, uh, the, the AI um, company from London, uh, that uh, mostly de deals with the interaction with humans, because it's where uh, we're going to be benchmarking our, our A's against, at least in, in this brief summary. So the first thing I want to comment on is uh, AI agents in competition and cooperation with humans, and then briefly mention some results on the dissection of AI brains. Now, this is a very interesting concept because, of course, uh, the, the bane of the neuroscientist is that the moment you dissect a, a, a biological brain, well, the brain ceases uh, function uh, and, uh, and the, the animal dies. So th there's, there's no longer the, the sort of functioning uh, uh, research that can be done. However, in, a, in an AI, this is obviously not the case and you can dissect and you can see the brain or quote unquote, the artificial brain uh, operating in real time without, without any trouble. So let, let, I'll, I'll make some comments about this. So I will just focus uh, uh, briefly on one single example of, of a recent triumph of, um, of uh, DeepMind's uh, artificial intelligence. And this is uh, the AlphaStar algorithm, uh, the AlphaStar um, sort of cohort of algorithms, which uh, attempted to beat human players in the, in the video game StarCraft II. Now, for context, for those of you who are unaware, StarCraft is a video game that was released in 1995, if I remember correctly, and has had an AI community uh, around it since its inception, pretty much. And uh, it's been uh, an, an open problem, uh, to, to put it in these more mathematical terms, to tackle uh, and, and to actually um, produce a general uh, AI that could beat humans consistently, not even at, at, at the highest levels of competitions, but just consistently for average level pl players. And this is not really possible. And everyone who's familiar with, with the game knows that the, the moment you learn uh, the, 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 the few basics, the first few months you play the game, the, the, the AI that comes with, it, with the game is insufficient to, to pose a challenge. So, so this was an, an open problem and uh, traditional programming seemed insufficient. So the big success of AlphaStar was indeed beating human players and indeed beating the pros, as we will see in a second. So here's, let me just uh, play this little uh, animation to give you a hint of, of, of what's going on. So, so this is a summary uh, uh, of, of, of AlphaStar uh, playing against Mana, a Polish uh, professional player. And, and you can see a little bit in, in, in real time how uh, the, the AI is operating. So the AI is taking the input directly from the screen as the player, as a human player. And you can see a little bit the, the real time reaction. So you can see um, the position in the, in the minimap that where the AI is, is uh, aiming, or you can see all the, all the options, all the little dots the, in the uh, bottom right is the, the different units you can create in StarCraft. StarCraft is a real time strategy game. You build your, your uh, military buildings and military units and you move them around the map. You give them commands and, and they fight the enemy units. So it's indeed uh, a very uh, visual way to summarize that, that this was an agent, an AI agent that was essentially doing the same as a human. And then you can look at the, in the, in the middle right, you can see this, this diagram that says outcome prediction. And you can see that, yeah, the AI is doing fairly well. This, uh, the outcome prediction of the, the win percentage seems uh, fairly high. So uh, our, our poor player mana is, is not doing that well against the, uh, the artificial intelligence here. Okay. So, why is this relevant? Why am I taking this particular example of, of StarCraft and not perhaps chess or Go or other, other games or other, other competitions between AIs and humans? So the reason why I selected this particular example is that, well, StarCraft II is a game that was selected by DeepMind precisely because of, because of its um, similarity with the real world. And let me explain this a little bit uh, in, in, in a bit more detail and, and let me illustrate why this is a huge deal. The fact that there was an AI that was bidding consistently and by, by you know, as of today, it's uh, consistently the best player in the world uh, uh, as, as it stands. So the first, the first um, uh, obvious thing is that this is a real time game. So most of the, of the, of the tasks that had pitched AIs against humans before were discrete in nature and, and they were played by turns, taking turns, right? So, so this is perhaps not a very significant change, but it's indeed an important one, at least to, um, to have a sense of, of, of interaction between AIs and humans, right? Because you can always think, well, there's so many, there's so many uh, um, computations that a computer can do uh, faster than a human that, you know, the fact that you can take arbitrary amount of time between, between moves, it's, it's a little bit 
uh, strange. But the fact that this is real time is is puts some constraints that, that makes the the interaction between humans and, and AIs a lot uh, uh, a lot more natural, right? Now, the very important thing uh, about StarCraft is that the, the the game space, the possible set of states and configurations of, of moving pieces, so to speak, is huge. It's ridiculously high. It's essentially virtually infinite. Um, there's there's so many uh, states that the, the no computer that was attached to the to the program when the when the simulations were running uh, sorry when the AIs were running uh, could actually comprehend that amount of data so you needed uh, an intelligence that, that reduced the complexity of all those possible states and actually somehow in in very broad terms understood what was going on to reduce the complexity because uh, something as simple as taking your initial worker to place the initial building you have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of, of possible positions for that initial work in that initial building. And, there's, and that's just a, a, a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the possible decisions you make in the game. So the game space is absolutely enormous. And, and so you need, uh, um, you need a, a, a cognitive algorithm to, to deal with that complexity because uh, what's important about this is, well, there is imperfect, imperfect information and then there's also constraints for the AI that are exactly symmetrical as for the human players. So that means that the AI could interact with the game. So this is where imperfect information also comes in. The AI could only interact with the game exactly in the same way that human can. So the AI did not know anything about the coding of the game, did not know anything about the actual um, running of the, of the game. So they, they only had imp access to the screen as, as a human player does, and they could only input um, actions uh, 150 um, uh, counts per minute. So 150 actions per minute might sound sound high, but professional players have a, a, about 300 or 400 actions per minute. So it was it was constrained to be an average player, and and it could only perceive the game exactly the same way that a, that a human uh, does. So they, they would never uh, they would never know exactly where things were. They would just see pixels on a screen. And and so it was it was that direct and that and that that faithful of analogy of uh, of a learning process and so anyway so I'm not an expert on, on AI again but uh, for those interested uh, here's the um, uh, the links and, and and indeed these systems used neural networks so these are um, artificial uh, algorithms so these are programmed on computers in the traditional binary based computers but um, they emulate the the sort of the architecture of of nervous of biological nervous systems. Um, uh, as we will see a little bit in the end, and, and th these are called neural networks for that reason. And then uh, they used a lot of imitation learning from uh, taking sort of samples of, of games that, that were already successful games or, or, or training data, as it's sometimes, sometimes called. And then they had reinforce reinforcement learning. So every time they, they won games or they achieved certain objectives within the game, uh, they would be um, given uh, some internal reinforcements, which again simulates what the way um, biological um, neural systems uh, operate. Okay, so briefly before we move on from uh, this category, let, let's talk. Uh, let's talk about a different game, a different um, uh, cooperative versus uh, or slash competitive um, scenario for AIs and humans. And this is Capture the Flag. So, in Capture the Flag, you had agents in space uh, that 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 they could navigate, and the aim was to go to the opponent base, take the flag, and and retrieve it to to yours, and, and then score. And so, what was really, really interesting, interesting about uh, this uh, this project is that AIs and humans were pitched in uh, the two versus two matches, and any combination was allowed. So it could be two humans against two AIs, and AI and a human against two AIs, etc. Any combination was allowed. And the really, really interesting thing is that AIs were trained in similar ways as, as for um, StarCraft II or chess or all these other um, neural network achieve recent achievements. Um, and the, what was really interesting, interesting is there was given no particular uh, reinforcement for um, uh, strategies that were uh, understood by players, by human players, as good as home-based defense, opponent-based camping, or a teammate following. These strategies that have been agreed in the in the community, in the in the FPS community, uh, who uh, where capture the flag is a mode that is that is typical. All these uh, ways of, of playing had not been hard coded, had not been given to these AIs, and had not been even uh, be um, motivated. So they were discovered and they were selected somehow as, as the most successful strategies, and they were observed as as, as this uh, little animation showcase. So these these are AIs uh, playing the game, behaving 
uh, with these very characteristic strategies that, that anyone who, who gets introduced to this to this uh, capture the flag mode in, in FPS games um, needs to learn about. So what is what is important about, about this particular study, which, which was also done primarily by, by DeepMind? So there's a few things that, that can be uh, extracted from this, and perhaps the most important one has to do with this uh, notion of dissecting the brain and looking at the brain of, of the AI when it's operating. And again, there will be a link at the end and you can look at the details, but the researchers uh, confirmed that the game world was indeed represented in, in, in the network somehow. So there was a topological representation of, of the interconnected rooms, etc. So there was a little bit of mapping between the physical or, or, or geometric um, environment of the AI and its neural network. So there was a little bit of topological um, uh, equivalence between the two. But most importantly is that they could detect what, what could be referred to as bit neurons, where the most successful agents that, that were, you know, after uh, uh, competition uh, against each other were selected as the, as the most proficient in playing capture the flag, had either uh, single uh, nodes or set of nodes that acted as, as essential bits of information. So for example, they, they could encode the enemy has the flag or the enemy doesn't have the flag. And, and, and that Boolean value of, of true or false, does the enemy has the flag, has the flag is true or false, that Boolean variable was encoded indeed in the network uh, in a completely uh, emergent way. It was never hard coded to be there. It was just uh, um, sort of found as an adaptive uh, process. Uh, the, the, the programmers never put uh, this structure there in the first place. So that, that's a, a very uh, evocative um, result to, to, the, to the appearance of logic and, 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 and perhaps a more um, binary thinking and, 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 and rational thinking from merely uh, adaptive uh, behavior. Right? It's, it's a very interesting it's a very interesting um, case of that. Um, now, of course, uh, the cooperative behaviors were naturally discovered, and, and you know uh, this is uh, without any explicit reinforcement. They, they were not reinforced uh, to to go to be cooperative. They just discovered cooperation as the as the most efficient um, um, strategy. And then, perhaps more anecdotally for for our talk, is that human agents. Uh, typically deemed AIs more cooperative than, than humans. So this was a situation where uh, humans reported after playing that uh, their, their fellow teammates were likely to be human because they were very cooperative, when in fact they were AIs. So it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a, of, a, of a point of reference for, for how far things have gone in, in, this, in this field. Anyway, so here's the, here's the link for uh, any extra information anyone uh, might want to check out. Okay. So the final category of um, cognitive systems that I want to review is a little bit unorthodox, I would say, uh, to, to consider at, at first. But hopefully by the end of, of my short presentation, you, you would agree with me that this is indeed a very, very interesting uh, possible case of cognitive system, or at least it should be. And it's, it's of course, ant colonies. So I want to emphasize two aspects of ant colonies. First is organization. Ant colonies are perhaps the most amazing self-organizing systems that we that we know in the planet uh, today. Um, as we will see in a second, it's it's a case of no design or no apparent uh, hidden design and an extreme organization. And then and, and most importantly uh, to the to the to the point of our of our current topic is the hive mind hypothesis or or what in the past have been an allegory of, of, of the of the hive behaving as an, as a super organism and 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 you know, using this analogy to understand the, 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 the interesting and, and, and perhaps uh, shocking behavior that we observe of, of colonies to think that there is a, m a mind behind behind that process. That in the past, that was that was merely used as a as an analogy. But we will see that actually recent uh, research shows that this might be more than an analogy. OK, so so let's have a look. So if anyone is unfamiliar with how um, ant colonies operate, well, I invite you to, to do a quick search and, and, and go to the to the standard uh, literature or watch some documentaries. It's absolutely incredible. Um, but the, the most important thing about uh, for, for, for our topic of discussion here is the fact that there is no design in in the in the colony. So what does it mean? Does it mean? So let's consider another um, another arthropod um, um, that there, there is that, that also uh, displays uh, uh, somehow striking design in, in, in the wild, which is uh, um, um, 
a spider's net, right? So, for example. So spider's net is somehow encoded in the, in the spider's DNA because the spider has all the instructions to, to somehow produce it. So, so that information of, of that structure is somehow encoded in that single organism. Now, a single ant does not have the information to, to, uh, the, to the structure of the, of, the, of the colony. Not at all. And we know that, as we will see in a second, for uh, reasons that, that have very, very uh, striking similarities with human psychology, but also just if we look at the structure of a colony. So in a colony, we have a queen laying eggs, we have egg hatcheries, we have a trash room, we have organization, we have storage, we have, you know, when there's surplus of, of food, there, there's storage, we have a, a nursery system and, and larvae are, are handled in, in, in different ways depending on, on how the environment uh, is, is, is behaving around the colony. And, and there is all this extremely uh, uh, complex behavior that has, that has no orchestrator. There's no single uh, organism, there's no single biological uh, animal that is, that is orchestrating all that complexity. So one is led to believe that there is, there is something about the interconnectivity of all these elements in, in, in interaction that, that creates all this, all, all this order. And one can always, always be a skeptical, and, and, and I, I, I'm not at all an, ex, an expert on this topic, so I don't want to uh, go too much into, into uh, think, uh, sort of the driving conclusions myself, but I want to uh, present the evidence that we have today. So the hive mind hypothesis uh, rests uh, primarily on, on a few observations that have been made for the last few decades or ha have, have been known for actually as long as we've known uh, ant colonies, but have recently been given uh, the status of, of what can be studied under cognitive sciences. And, and I will basically essentially uh, review the literature in, 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 and, and, and quote the experts. So, but the first observation before we do that is that indeed ant colonies fit the cognitive loop. That we that we presented at the beginning, so both uh, biological nervous systems and AIs were both because we are biological nervous systems and because AIs are made to compete with humans, they clearly fit in the cognitive loop because they are either evolved to do that and we are that, or they are designed to do that. But now ant colonies are not obvious to fit this cognitive loop, right? So how do ant colonies fit the cognitive loop? Well, they fit the cognitive loop by having um, the process of interacting with the environment. So for example, if you, if you have the, the experience of dropping some food near an ant colony, you probably remember that at first you see one or two ants sort of strolling a bit randomly around the food. And then if one of them comes into contact with the food, then maybe it goes back in a direction and then a bit later another comes, etc., etc. And so there is a process of releasing chemicals and communicating both, both specially and chemically between the ants to the point where you see an entire path of, of, of ants that go to the food and chew on it or try to uh, to move it towards the towards the center of the colony and then effectively by the end of the, of the process there is no food where, where where it was dropped in the first place so that could be uh, analogous to you know uh, a human being 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 hungry then uh, spotting some food then reaching out with a with the arm and, and taking the food to to, the, to their mouths and then and, and swallowing it. it it's a very similar uh, process, in fact, then the digestion and, and, and the whole process that, that goes afterwards is, is, is also analogous to what happens in the, in the colony. So that's what we mean by uh, the ant colony is fitting the, the cognitive loop. That there is a sense of, of, uh, sort of taking an input and processing and then generating an output. Okay. Now, another very interesting fact that um, somehow supports this interpretation of, of ant colonies is the fact that there have been studies that show that colonies have some form of memory and or some form of uh, personality perhaps that depends on their history and uh, to the point that you need this information to make predictions on how uh, ant colonies will behave in in the, in the immediate future so under control conditions it has been observed that uh, similar uh, conditions produced statistically significant different outcomes um, based on previous history of ant colonies and, and therefore uh, given the idea that there is a sense of memory in the in the in the colony and what's relevant here is that these memories are kept for way way longer than the lifespan of any individual ant therefore it's impossible that those memories are kept in the nervous system of an individual ant because that's always uh, a, a possible critique you could think well 
I mean, ants do have a nervous system. Uh, I mean, it's it's a very rudimentary nervous system compared to something like like an, an like an uh, like an octopus or like an ape or a human. But they are sophisticated sophisticated nervous systems. So there is the possibility that those memories are stored in some of those um, individual ants. But the fact that these memories last way longer than any uh, singular um, lifespan then uh, leads uh, to the to the conclusion that indeed there is something uh, memory-like going on. And then uh, lastly, I simply wanted to uh, mention or, or actually literally quote uh, recent research on, on on ant colonies where psychological techniques, that is human psych psychological techniques, or, or at least de developed for humans in, in their origins, have been applied to, uh, to the study of uh, colonies. And, and so this is, I think, what summarizes uh, perfectly uh, the point I want to make about uh, ant colonies. And I invite you to follow the links that are, that are uh, at the bottom. And I will just simply read uh, one of the quotes from uh, one of the lead scientists in, in this field. So Stephen Pratt says, a brain or a colony processes information about its environment and about its own state, and then produces some adaptive behavior that's appropriate for the conditions. He says, you can call that cognitive. Uh, indeed, research shows how the superorganism concept is more than an illustrative analogy. So this is uh, uh, the, uh, Stephen Pratt talking about um, uh, colonies and colonies. And you can check the, uh, the, the psychology of superorganisms, the publication, the, the mind of the anthill is, is more of a, of a, a public science article and it's very, very approachable. And I do invite you to, to, to explore this topic. It's, it's really fascinating. Okay. so. So we've talked about three large categories of, of systems that seem to have something in common and that we could deem cognitive just by analogy, just by the fact that, well, they kind of behave in this way. Well, AIs are kind of made to, to behave in this way. But and we can indeed do that and just you know leave it at that and, and have, a, have a nice discussion afterwards and, and be uh, inspired by all this diversity of examples, but actually I wanted to go the, the extra mile and, 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 and use some of the recent or relatively recent um, theoretical developments in what's called network theory to actually discuss a little bit the structural uh, similarities of, of all these systems, because they do have something structural in common. And I think it's, it's already apparent um, from, from our discussion, but, uh, but I want to discuss it, I want to go into the details a little bit more. So the first thing I would do is talk about net network theory very succinctly, very briefly, because it indeed, it, it indeed provides a powerful formalism to extract fundamental properties uh, of all these systems. And then in turn, that would allow us to, uh, to give um, quantitative, um, uh, quantitative uh, comparisons and, and make um, more uh, definite and systematic uh, comparisons between these systems and, and therefore lead to a more systematic science of, of these things. So. Briefly, what are the basic features of a network in, in the sense of network theory? So for the mathematicians in the audience, these are essentially directed graphs, but for the rest of mortals, we uh, understand a network simply as uh, a, a set of nodes that we abstract as something having uh, almost no, no internal structure and then links, which are essentially paths or connections between, between these nodes. You, you might want to have different kinds of nodes or different kinds of links or have a little bit of structure inside the nodes to represent uh, systems that are a bit more complex, but essentially that's that's the idea. Okay. Now, how do we parameterize uh, a network? How what are the main features of, of of a network? The main metrics of a network? Well, there's an obvious size, so number of nodes, the aggregate number of nodes. These are all the nodes in your network. There is how connected it is, right? So the, we could, for example, measure the average number of links connected to a single node. So some average measure of how connected it is. I mean, there's many, many ways of, of um, characterizing connectedness, but this is a simple intuitive one that will be useful for the illustration that I want to do in, in, in this talk. And then finally, um, networks will always abstract something that, that is quite complex usually. So uh, you might want to uh, throw in a little bit more granularity and a little bit more complexity uh, and a little bit more detail, usually in the form of different kinds of, of links or nodes having different um, states. So um, you will see in the examples that, that it's quite obvious that nodes need to have states. And in, in the more computer science context, you might think of nodes, um, for example, keeping uh, some set of variables and, and having values for those variables in, in, in their, in their, inside them somehow, right? So you might want to 
um, to characterize that as you know the number of, of data types that, that a node keeps or the number of possible states that a node can be in, right? So it, it's just a, some some rough uh, notions. We're not going to get into them into any mathematical details, of course. Um, it's just uh, for for the sake of illustration. Okay, so these basic uh, features allow us to very very roughly give a, 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 an overall picture of all the systems that we've discussed so far in the talk. So let's have a look. So how do we read this table? So we have human brains at the top, and, and we, we can see that here we have uh, the, the different systems, and we're going to list what is the nodes and where, where are the links. So what is the network uh, that, that makes the system? And then we're going to give some estimates of, um, of the metrics of that system. So, so for example, for, for human brains as reference, uh, we're going to have our nodes being the neurons, the individual neurons. Uh, the links, of course, are the, the synaptic connections between the neurons or the, you know, the, the direct influence between neurons. Um, then uh, we count the number of neurons. We know that we are in, the, in, in that rough order of 10 to the 11 uh, neurons. And then we, um, we uh, look at the literature and we check that the average number of neurons that a singular neuron is connected to is roughly around 1,000 on average. So we, we uh, write a 10 to the 3 um, order of magnitude in, in, in connectedness. And then uh, in terms of the, the node complexity, S, remember, is, um, measures the, the node complexity, we're basically just going to illustrate three kinds of nodes. So we're going to have biological neurons, um, neural network, artificial neural network neurons or, or nodes, and then uh, ants in, a, in an ant colony. So in those three cases, uh, the biological neuron has a moderate complexity because you know it, it is fairly more complex than 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 a computing node in a in an a, in an AI algorithm, but it's l way less complex than a full ant that is itself made of hundreds of thousands of neurons and has all kinds of uh, metabolism and physiology going on in in the system. Okay, so that's how we read this table. So we have the human brain at the top. Um, this, is, this is always the notion, right? That we're looking down to uh, to other uh, fellow cognitive systems in, in, in the world. Um, but perhaps you want to change this point of view by the end of this talk. This a little bit the uh, the whole point of this. Um, and then you can see how uh, it compares to a to a chimpanzee brain, for example, an octopus brain. You can see that there is there's just a, a game of numbers here. I mean, in terms of raw numbers, you can already spot differences that that are apparent. Um, and it, perhaps these numbers are again very rough estimates, and themselves are just uh, an illustration. Uh, they are here just to illustrate. Um, but I just wanted to make the case of uh, of, of the, the orders of magnitudes themselves. If you identify uh, elements that will be somehow interconnected, you can see that indeed something like Alpha Star that has uh, uh, 10 to the 7 uh, different um, uh, variables or different parameters that, that would be readjusted. Uh, again, it's not really fair to compare directly that number to the number of neurons, perhaps. But um, but indeed, it's 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 something uh, similar in some sense, and, and the, at least the number, uh, the order of magnitude is certainly getting there. And so it's it's perhaps no joke to think that these things are, are actually realistically getting uh, somehow physically close, or or in terms of, of pure numbers uh, close. But but the most important um, uh, bit of information I wanted to highlight from this table is indeed the ant colony. So the kind of network that an ant colony forms as a, as a possible cognitive system is considerably more sophisticated than, than a brain in, in particular, right? So um, indeed, the total number of, of nodes is quite lower than, for example, a human brain. It's, it's typically uh, around half a million of, of individuals in, in, the, in the big complex colonies in, in, in the, that are known in the world. However, if you think about how ants operate, in principle, all ants can be connected to all ants. Uh, I mean, obviously, timescales will be very, very different. But if we if we sort of um, account for the, the, the timescale difference, there is, in principle, a connectivity that is that is much, much higher to the point that because ants move and they can, you know, uh, tra traverse different parts of the colony and so on, in principle, every single ant can be in contact with every single other ant. And that creates a, a, a degree of connectivity that is way, way, way higher than is several orders of magnitude higher than, than in any other of the examples of the cognitive systems that we have here. And in particular, the type of connection uh, and the complexity of the connection between the, the, the nodes, if we think of the ants as the, as the nodes, is considerably more sophisticated than, than, for example, the synaptic 
um, link between between neurons and, and let alone the the um, um, the convolution uh, connections in a, in a in an in an artificial network, right? So I just I just wanted to highlight that as uh, in terms of numbers, and also have a summary of, of the rough orders of magnitudes of of all the systems. Also to 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 make the general point that we have at our disposal a theoretical framework where where um, all these systems can be studied on equal footing. And it's of course in early stages, and there's a lot more work to be done. But it's a very pro promising prospect of uh, having um, a, 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 a hard science of, of cognitive systems. So, so indeed, uh, cognitive science having a, a more um, systematic and more empirical uh, method to, to to run with, right? Okay, so. Um, as a closing of, of my talk, that uh, I think that's uh, quite a lot of information already, I wanted to again go back to the original uh, concept that, that I opted uh, that I that I opted to to begin my, my talk with, which was this uh, funny word cognitiveness. That is, is not cognition; it's, it's the property of being cognitive somehow. Um, and and I just wanted to, to to basically make a point to to say this is an important topic. Let's think about it. Let's study it. Let's enthusiastically <laughs> research. Uh, on, on this on this matters because I think it has a very promising future, um, and so what I want to say about cognitiveness is on the first uh, on on, uh, on the first hand, uh, is a is it a physical property of a system? Is it something that we can measure? In principle, it should be because indeed it is part of the real world. There's nothing mysterious about a, a you know a, a community of ants that is that is operating. I mean, it's a very complex system, of course. There's there's the barrier of complexity, but in principle, one should expect that given sufficient theoretical um, framework and 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 fine enough uh, em empirical methods, we could in principle have a systematic science for for these kind of phenomena. And clearly, there is something distinct and and characteristic about certain kinds of systems in the world, uh, and and not others. I mean, clearly. Uh, the, the droplets and uh, of water in the sea, I mean, could have a, a degree of complexity, perhaps in some sense similar to uh, to a colony of ants or a human brain, but we don't we don't observe uh, behavior that that is comparable to to a human brain or a, or a colony of ants. So, so this is something that that is uh, uh, that is something uh, this is something that I really think that uh, should be explored and possibly um, all these concepts will will uh, aid in that future research. And then secondly. And perhaps the, the message of the talk, or the takeaway uh, uh, of the of the talk, is uh, you know a little um, a little uh, a hint to my um, to my mathematicians. A little joke is uh, the continuum hypothesis uh, of cognition, right? So can we uh, perhaps uh, calling the psychocentrism our tradition of thinking of human uh, cognition of human mind as being somehow the the the, the, the privileged way of cognition? Uh, could we do away with that and, and have a more generalistic uh, approach to cognition and just have a landscape in which you know we, we might be closer to uh, to uh, chimps in some way but you know closer to uh, artificial AIs in another way but we are no none, none is better or, or more than other in some sense uh, it's just a, a landscape of, of different possibilities and, and different modes of cognition or types of minds and just uh, with this concept I, I leave you with uh, a few examples, a few speculative examples of what could be other minds. And this is uh, indeed just a speculation, it's just uh, uh, my imagination running wild and, uh, and some uh, enticing ideas uh, to think about as, as, the, as the closing of, of the talk. So for example, we could have um, what happens when we have several brains or no brain or no clear center of, of computation. We could have a, a de decentralized uh, processing, a, a type of cognition that we could call decentralized. Um, if that system is to become conscious uh, in some sense, uh, not, not getting into the, into the problem of defining consciousness, but if that uh, system develops something like our consciousness, it would probably uh, sound like something like a committee of consciousness. And this is something that is mentioned in the book Other Minds uh, about the octopuses. And, and so one potential example is indeed the octopus, because uh, apparently the anatomy of, of, of the nervous system of octopuses is so that there are so many neurons in in the in the tentacles that it's almost like a committee where uh, the central brain is acting as a as a moderator of of the eight brains per one per per tentacle. So that's that's one possibility. The other possibility is that, and perhaps the the one that I that I find most exciting because it's uh, really quite different from 
what we are used to is a, is a little reflection on how we perceive um, our, our uh, sensory input, right? So sensory input is usually um, perceived in channels that are very, very thin and their, their, their bandwidth is way, way shorter than uh, the, the actual size of the processing unit, right? If you think of uh, the, the nervous complexity, the, the, the anatomical complexity of an eye or a, a tactile sensors and stuff like that, compared to the complexity of the whole brain, you can see that, that you know, several orders of magnitudes of, of, of uh, indifference in complexity, right? So. There, there is in, in most of the in most of the cognitive systems that we study and we design artificially there is this very uh, stark separation between the sensor and the processor right there, there is that that separation and, and usually the, the sensor is quite simple and the processor is quite sophisticated so what happens when the sensor and processor uh, are one and the same and, and the whole system is both a sensor and a processor uh, simultaneously so if such system were um, to, the, to develop some form of consciousness, what would that be? Is, is, is it dispersed? Because, I mean, we clearly associate our consciousness with being somewhere, being a self somewhere, somehow. Uh, so maybe it's a dispersed kind of consciousness, as a little bit uh, speculation. But this case is, is particularly motivated by the example of, uh, of an ant colony. Because in an ant colony, even though there is a little bit of specialization in, 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 in different uh, ants that, that, that play different roles, essentially speaking, um, the entire colony is at the same time somehow processing and at the same time constantly sensing everywhere. Every single ant can be a sensor in some sense and at the same time it's also a computing unit. So that little speculation is inspired by, by the ant colony. Right? And then finally, if we agree that cognitive systems have uh, some essential network structure that they that they uh, manifest, then uh, it's very natural to propose, as a, especially as a mathematician would do, is to say, well, if uh, this is the required structure for a, for a cognition, now replace whatever you have in your nodes by a full cognitive system and make that into a into a um, into a new cognitive system. So this is a network of cognitive systems that, in itself, would be considered a, a cognitive system just structurally, right? Um, and so perhaps uh, for lack of a better term, uh, this, this could display a form of hyper-consciousness in some sense, uh, in the sense that there is a consciousness going on in a system where each of the atomic parts or of, compu of, of computing power uh, also um, have consciousness in some sense. I mean, th these two consciousness probably will never uh, know of each other and be able to interact in any meaningful way. Um, and so, of course, the, 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 the example is not mine. Uh, this, is, this is, has been discussed many, many times by many by many scientists before, but a, a, a very possible and, and clear example of this could be indeed the internet. I mean, if one um, makes the case of um, of um, how uh, perception works and what the world is for internet and how the the, um, the sensory input arrives in the internet and how the processing goes and so on, when, when one could think of human beings being the processing units and, and then the entire network uh, having uh, some form of mind of its own. And, and so this is the, the classic, is the internet aware of itself and, and so on. So I leave, I leave you on that note, the more uh, of a fantastical and a speculative note to think about. Hope you enjoyed, see you next time.